Hello, I'm Allison Johnson, and I would like to read for you passages from my book titled Amputated Lives, Coping with Chemical Sensitivity. I would like to begin with a preface. All my books and documentaries have had a central goal in mind, to convince readers and viewers that chemical sensitivity is real and is devastating far too many lives. In the 10 years that have passed since I have produced and directed my first documentary, Multiple Chemical Sensitivity, How Chemical Exposures May Be Affecting Your Health, more and more people have been succumbing to this condition. Hardly a day goes by that I do not hear from someone who is close to despair because they see their former life slipping away from them as they struggle with a condition that the medical profession has largely ignored. Last month, a taxi cab driver from Las Vegas emailed to say, I was making good money driving a taxi and had to resign because the other driver would spray it with air freshener. Eventually, the cab made me so sick I had to quit. Another email came from a New York City police detective who toiled for months in the World Trade Center cleanup and is now too sick to work. He has become extremely sensitive to cleaning products, fragrances, and diesel exhaust and summed up his condition by saying, I am beyond miserable. An artist who found it enormously difficult to find a place to live that she can tolerate expressed her frustration by writing, in the search for a new home, I came to know full well an overwhelming feeling of desperation. And along with that desperation came the growing conviction that the chemically sensitive are viewed as throwaway people. In part two of my book, People who are chemically sensitive describe in their own words how this has changed their lives forever. I've also used extensive quotes from these individuals in part one instead of filtering their experience through my own words. It is my hope that this book will persuade readers that those unfortunate enough to have developed multiple chemical sensitivity are not throwaway people, but the proverbial canaries in the mine alerting us that the rapid proliferation in chemical products in our environment may be endangering all of us. My introduction begins this way. Four cataclysmic events have rocked the United States in the last two decades. The 1989 Exxon Valdez oil spill, the 1991 Gulf War, the destruction of the World Trade Center in 2001, and Hurricane Katrina in 2005. At first glance, these events might seem to have little in common, but all left in their wake significant numbers of people who are now chronically ill after exposure to large amounts of toxic chemicals. Regrettably, the national attention span is short. The sick workers who helped clean up the oil from the Alaskan beaches are not on anyone's radar screen. Two of them whom I interviewed were coughing so hard because of the asthma they had developed after cleaning the beaches that we could hardly continue the conversation. In November of 2000, the American Journal of Epidemiology published a study showing that 34% of those who served in the Gulf War, over 200,000 veterans, are now chronically ill. The young men and women who answered the country's call to serve on what has been termed the most toxic battlefield in history have felt abandoned for over 17 years. Then there were the heroes who responded to the World Trade Center disasters. Slogans on bumper stickers and in store windows throughout New York proclaimed that the 9-11 heroes would never be forgotten. Now most feel that they have indeed been forgotten as their health deteriorates and they lose their jobs and the medical insurance that went with those jobs. In the case of Katrina, neglect has been even more evident and little has been done to acknowledge the widespread exposure to toxic chemicals and mold encountered by residents and cleanup workers. And I would like to note at this point, I published Amputated Lives, Coping with Chemical Sensitivity in 2008. And now, if I were writing the book now, I would in have included a chapter about the BP oil spill, which is beginning to create the same sort of problems with chemical sensitivity developing in those people exposed to all that toxic oil. My introduction continues in this way. Large numbers of people who became chronically ill after these major exposure events have developed a new sensitivity to the chemicals they encounter in everyday life, 
in substances like perfume, paint, gasoline, cigarette smoke, diesel exhaust, new carpet cleaning products, and air fresheners. Change comes very slowly in huge government bureaucracies, but Dr. Ronald Blank, who was the U.S. Army Surgeon General and the commander of Walter Reed Army Medical Center during much of the 1990s, was one leader who began to question the stress theory that assumed that the illnesses suffered by so many returning veterans were psychologically based. In my documentary, Gulf War Syndrome, Aftermath of a Toxic Battlefield, the 2004 version, Dr. Blank states, and I quote, in the mid-1990s, I commanded Walter Reed Army Medical Center. I continued to work on looking for causes for the illnesses suffered by many Gulf War veterans, illnesses that were clearly more than stress-related. I looked at vaccines. I looked at exposure to smokes, to other toxic chemicals, petrochemicals, and so forth. All that were part of that battlefield experience. And I came to the conclusion that at least one of the explanations was multiple chemical sensitivity, something where a variety of toxic elements, even at low levels by themselves, in combination may, in susceptible individuals, be causing these illnesses. And I believe that so much more work needs to be done on that, but it is clearly one of the explanations. Although there's been increased recognition that there are other causes than stress for these illnesses, really the sea change happened in the last year or so, and is highlighted by an article in the New York Times of October 15, 2004, that states many of the old veterans suffer from neurological damage caused by exposure to toxic chemicals. In a 1999 article in Archives of Environmental Health that was titled Multiple Chemical Sensitivity, a 1999 Consensus, a group of 34 researchers and clinicians proposed the following criteria for the clinical diagnosis of MCS. One, the symptoms are reproducible with repeated exposure. Two, the condition is chronic. Three, low levels of exposure result in manifestations of the syndrome. Four, the symptoms improve or resolve when the incitants are removed. Five, responses occur to multiple chemically unrelated substances. Six, symptoms involve multiple organ systems. Continuing with passages that I wrote in my introduction, one of the most distinctive features of MCS is that people who develop the condition begin to react to low-level chemical exposures that never bothered them previously. Some MCS patients have only mild cases. For others, the condition can be life-threatening. People with MCS can have a wide variety of symptoms as a result of chemical exposures, with different patients having different symptoms. A given patient, however, will usually have the same symptom in response to a given exposure, perhaps getting a headache after exposure to paint or getting arthritic pains after exposure to natural gas. Even though researchers do not yet agree on a precise definition for the condition, the stories in part two of my book illustrate how chemical sensitivity can destroy a productive life all too quickly. Many people with MCS are so sensitive to fragrances that they virtually become prisoners in their own home, unable to go to church, work, classes, or social gatherings because they will react to the perfume, aftershave, shampoos, detergents, or fabric softeners used by others. To make matters worse, some of those who insist that MCS is a psychologically based illness state that these people are suffering from agoraphobia or fear of crowds. That's as cruel as saying to a paraplegic in a wheelchair, too bad you don't like to walk. Newspaper conditions often refer to multiple chemical sensitivity as a rare condition, but this is hardly the case. In 2004, the Archives of Environmental Health published a national prevalence study by Stanley Kress and Ann Steinemann. These researchers reported that in their national random phone survey, 2.5% of the respondents said that they had been diagnosed with MCS. This result suggests that over 7 million Americans may be suffering from multiple chemical sensitivity, a number that exceeds the population of Massachusetts. This is hardly a rare condition, as it is frequently termed in the media. The potential for MCS to gradually increase a person's sensitivity to the point that he or she can't find a workplace and can, can be tolerated leads to a situation in which large numbers of chemically sensitive people 
eventually end up with no choice but to turn to public assistance like SSI, Social Security Supplemental Income. This is yet another reason why the medical profession and government bodies should turn their attention to a condition that has the potential to be a huge drain on public finances. One of the most respected researchers in the field of chemical sensitivity is William Meigs, MD, PhD, a toxicologist and professor at East Carolina University's Brody School of Medicine. Dr. Meigs has published many articles in peer-reviewed journals detailing, among other topics, his research using biopsies to investigate damage to the nasal lining of chemically sensitive patients. When I interviewed Dr. Meigs for my documentary on MCS, he stated, I've spent a lot of time applying for research grants to try and study these illnesses and the role of chemicals in these illnesses. And my grant applications come back with scathing comments like, don't spend any money on this research because everybody knows it's all psychological. It's hardly surprising that industry doesn't want anyone to believe that chemical exposures could produce a debilitating condition like MCS. The consequences for corporations would be enormous if members of the public increasingly began to wonder if installing new carpet, using pesticides in their house or yard, or buying particle board cabinets or furniture might affect their health. And imagine the potential liability problems if people could prove that exposures in factories hospitals, schools, or offices had destroyed their health. To understand the power that industry wields regarding MCS, one need only remember that the tobacco industry managed for decades to keep the public from recognizing the hazards of smoking. They were able to succeed in this agenda not only by funding research that would encourage people to think that smoking was safe, but also by discouraging any research that might show the dangers of smoking. If the tobacco industry, which represents a very small fraction of American business, could exercise so much power, it is indeed staggering to consider the influence against validating MCS that is wielded by corporations when almost every business in the United States is significantly involved in chemical use in one way or another. What advertiser would want to run ads on a TV show that raised the possibility that chemical exposures could be creating serious illness? Certainly not advertisers from the cosmetic, pesticide, construction, or carpet industries. Another unfortunate aspect of the psychological approach to the issue of chemical sensitivity is that critics of MCS frequently suggest that secondary gain is a strong component of this condition. According to secondary gain theorists, those with MCS are engaging in certain behavior patterns in order to get special attention or because they want others to take care of them. One does not have to read many of the stories in part two of my book before it becomes apparent that this suggestion is at best made in ignorance and at worst represents an exceedingly cruel attitude toward people whose illness has in all too many cases cost them their job, their home, their friends, or their spouse. MCS is in all too many cases an illness of devastating and overwhelming loss, not secondary gain. John, a former Shakespeare professor living with chemical sensitivity, described his situation in these poignant words. I have been told that early retirement is the American dream. Early retirement because of disability and a chronic progressive illness is nothing but a bad dream involving the loss of family, home, career, friends, mobility, income, and one's health, almost everything one holds precious. Nor is secondary gain a phrase that would come to mind when one reads the words of Miranda, a woman who had worked in a land use planning office in California and enjoyed activities like hiking in the Himalayas before she developed MCS. Miranda wrote this, living with chemical sensitivity is being chronically ill and feeling crummy most of the time. After nine years of that, it really wears on you. It's really tiring. And I don't know how to explain this condition to people. It's drudgery and monotonous and lonely and isolating, and your old friends and your family don't want to hear about it, and I don't want to hear about it, but it's my life. Another chemically sensitive person who, um, whom I quote in my book, Amputated Lives, had this to say, MCS has had a profound impact on my life. I went from a life of plans and dreams, like getting married and having a family, to a life of constant struggle, 
During my 16 years of illness, there have been literally hundreds of days of frustration, isolation, and extreme discomfort. Every day becomes a challenge to minimize the exposures that would make me sick, but the exposures are everywhere and never ending. Scented fabric softener fumes from a neighbor's dryer vent, nearby pesticide spraying, a coworker using perfume or cologne, toxic cleaners used on a store floor, <clears throat> and office buildings with outgassing synthetic materials. Neighbors' use of pesticides led indirectly to the death of Nancy Noren, a computer systems analyst who is extremely sensitive to pesticides. According to an October 3, 1998 article in the Albuquerque Tribune, a life-threatening disease often forced Nancy Noren to flee her Rio Rancho home in the middle of the night to find refuge and a few hours sleep on a remote mesa. But it was on that mesa that the 51-year-old Rio Rancho woman may have met her death. Authorities confirmed Friday that a partly concealed body found earlier this week west of Albuquerque was Noren, who had been reported missing since July 17th. The police eventually arrested a 22-year-old man who was stopped for speeding while he was driving Nancy's truck. Notes he had written indicated that he had been stalking Nancy on the mesa for some time. He was tried and convicted for her murder. Friends of Nancy relate how her extreme sensitivity to the pesticides that her neighbors sprayed on their lawns affected her. One friend reported, Nancy was totally incapacitated by pesticides and told me that it affected her whole body. The worst thing was that some of her neighbors were just not willing to talk about it at all and were quite rude about it. She wanted to ask them if they would at least warn her before applying pesticides so she could have the windows and doors closed, but they weren't even willing to do that. When she would detect the pesticide had been sprayed, she would fly around the house closing windows as fast as possible, but it would still get in and cause her lots of pain. That's why on bad days, she would have to just abandon the house and go walk on the mesa for most of the day. When the pesticide fumes were really bad, she would take her truck and camp in the camper shell on the back for a few days. Most of the time she camped out on the mesa because in a campground the charcoal lighter fluid and the cleaning products in the restrooms were a major problem for her. One of Nancy's other friends wrote, Nancy realized her home was no longer good for her to be in, but she really couldn't conceive of moving for both financial and physical reasons. And we all know how difficult it is for people with MCS to find safe, affordable housing she admitted to being overwhelmed by the idea of having to move. Nancy Noren would be alive today had she been able to find suitable housing where she wasn't exposed to pesticides. Finding safe housing is crucial for an individual attempting to climb out of the mire of MCS because living with constant exposure to toxic chemicals usually exacerbates or perpetuates the condition. Three national studies have shown that avoidance of chemical exposures is about the only therapy that seems to help virtually everybody with MCS feel better and regain some degree of health. In some cases, a period of avoidance allows people with MCS the opportunity to reduce their level of sensitivity to chemicals sufficiently to enable them to work once again and to move about more freely in society. I consider chapter three in my book, titled The Consequences of Disbelief, one of the most important chapters in the book. I begin it in this way. One of the most difficult challenges faced by those with MCS is the widespread disbelief in the condition that they encounter from people who think it is simply a psychological disorder. Dr. Robert Haley of the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas who is heading a $15 million a year research program on Gulf War syndrome, used to hold that opinion. When I was interviewing him for my book, Gulf War Syndrome, Legacy of a Perfect War, Dr. Haley told me this, quote, before I got involved in the Gulf War syndrome research, I assumed that MCS was a psychological problem. I've seen it now reported by so many veterans who clearly are not psychologically impaired that I now consider MCS and related problems a very serious medical issue in need of serious research.
When I showed my Toxic Clouds of 9-11 documentary in Ottawa in November of 2006, a young woman in her 20s told me afterwards that she couldn't even spend Christmas with her family the next month. The reason? Her mother said they wouldn't be able to have a fire in the fireplace if she came. It seems likely that the mother thought her daughter's problems were imaginary and therefore did not deserve to be accommodated. Disbelief was also a huge problem for Linda, who worked as a nurse in the VA State Nursing Home in Vermont. She developed MCS, as did four of her co-workers. They attributed their chemical sensitivity to the strong cleaning products used in the nursing home. When these women started asking their co-workers to refrain from wearing perfume, they were ostracized, as Linda describes in her story that appears in my book, Pet Casualties of Progress. She wrote, Co-workers stopped speaking to us, and jokes were made at our expense. Then a new assistant administrator came on board who asked us if we were aware of internal email messages that some of the women in the facility had been sending to one another about us on the co company computers. I find it hard to describe my emotions when I read the email messages. I felt like I had been kicked in the stomach. Reading how my coworkers conspired to wear heavy amounts of perfume, all the same kind on the same day, was horrifying. They even named the day according to the perfume they chose to wear that day. For example, one day was named Peach Petals Day. They bragged about spraying the bathroom that we used with perfume and about spraying the top of the stairway we used. One of the worst perfume offenders wrote on the email, like I said before, shoot the bitches. I know where we can get some bullets. And this woman is a registered nurse. We did not obtain the email messages until September 1996. It happened that my mother had died on July 15, 1996. I remember working on July 14, 1996, so ill I didn't think I could survive because the perfume was so heavy that day. The nursing home that my mother resided in called me on July 14 to tell me that she might not survive the night. My husband begged me to go to the emergency room for myself because I was having such a hard time breathing. My lungs were so congested that he could hear my respirations across the room. But I couldn't take time to go to the emergency room because I wanted to be with my mother as she was dying. As it turned out, the nurses at her nursing home worried more about me that night than about their patients. I cannot forget how I suffered that night, both from losing my mom and from the physical suffering that I later learned was the result of a malicious prank by my coworkers. When I read the emails and recognized the date of Peach Petals Day as being the day I was called to the nursing home to be with my dying mother, I felt violated. My grief felt fresh all over again. Because of the email evidence, Linda was able to take her case to the Human Rights Commission in Vermont. In December 1996, its members voted in favor of her claim, stating that she had been discriminated against on the basis of a disability, MCS. I have heard of many similar cases, but I suspect that most people who hear about such abusive practice discount the reports, thinking that no one could be that mean. Sadly, the Vermont case indicates that even nurses can be cruel in some instances. Because of the email evidence, Linda was able to take her case to the Human Rights Commission in Vermont. In December 1996, its members voted in favor of her claim, stating that she had been discriminated against on the basis of a disability, MCS. I have heard of many similar cases, but I suspect that most people who hear about such abusive practices discount the reports, thinking that no one could be that mean. Sadly, the Vermont case indicates that even nurses can be cruel in some instances. Unfortunately, the widespread disbelief about MCS in the medical community, which affects the attitudes of the general public, emboldens people like the nursing home employees who were in effect assaulting Linda and her sensitive co-workers with perfume. They may well have justified their bad behavior by a belief that Linda and other women were just delusional people who were trying to control others in an unreasonable way. A former Marine who served in the Gulf War, Staff Sergeant Terry Dillion, received a discharge summary from the VA hospital in Washington, D.C. that listed among his conditions 
quote, possible multiple chemical sensitivity, end quote. Terry reports in his story in part two, the doctor who told me I had multiple chemical sensitivity said he wasn't allowed to write that in the diagnosis. He could only say possible multiple chemical sensitivity. The disbelief of a different physician had a huge financial impact on Terry, who is too sick to work and must use a wheelchair much of the time. Terry wrote, when I went to a civilian doctor in connection with my application to obtain Medicare coverage from the Social Security Administration, I happened to mention that I had MCS. He went ballistic and said, so you're one of those people. Let me tell you what, you've just lost all your credibility with me. He turned in a negative report to the Social Security Board, which then denied me Medicare coverage. Not long after Terry was turned down for Medicare coverage, he ended up in the hospital because of an asthma attack precipitated by exposure to a perfume insert and a magazine he was reading. His ambulance, emergency room, and hospital bills totaled $5,500, which Terry had to pay himself because he had been turned down for Medicare. The next passages that I would like to read from Chapter 3, The Consequences of Disbelief, concern suicide or suicide attempts. Now, I realize that suicide is a topic people really shy away from discussing. It's almost a taboo topic in our subject, but there are times we really must address it in order to save lives in the future. Continuing reading from my chapter on the consequences of disbelief, Sue, who suffers from extreme chemical sensitivity, did give up on life on two occasions, both directly related to the great difficulty she had experienced trying to find a safe place to work and to live. In her story in part two, she describes in poignant terms the despair that drove her to try to take her own life, even though she had a very supportive husband who loved her very much. In her story, she relates the enormous sense of frustration she felt when physicians, friends, and family viewed her symptoms with skepticism. One particularly tragic example of the fact that disbelief can indeed sometimes kill appears in an email that I recently received from Anne McCampbell, MD, a board member of My Chemical Sensitivity Foundation. She has written a very useful educational booklet on multiple chemical sensitivity. Dr. McCampbell wrote, a woman named Rachel had called me a couple of weeks ago and wanted to order 50 of my booklets. When I called back to say they were ready to ship, a woman answered the phone and said that Rachel was deceased, had hung herself about a week ago. I am racking my brain to remember what she might have told me about her situation. I know she wanted booklets to try and increase awareness of and sympathy towards chemical sensitivities, but I don't remember the details. It's clear that Rachel was so concerned about the disbelief she was encountering that she was willing to spend a considerable amount of money on booklets to try to counter this disbelief. Rachel's tragic death and Sue's two suicide attempts show that there are many ways to assist in suicide. Dr. Jack Kevorkian was strongly condemned for assisting in suicide. Unfortunately, many physicians, employers, family, and friends are in effect assisting in suicide through their disbelief. In 1996, I happened to hear somewhat by chance that in the same three-week period that year, two chemically sensitive people took their own lives and another woman with MCS ended up in the hospital with a failed suicide attempt. A number like this must unfortunately be only the tip of a dismaying iceberg. When I asked in my 1996 survey of 351 people with MCS, if the respondents had heard of MCS suicides, I received reports of dozens of such suicides. One man replied, yes, it is fundamentally disturbing to me to relate that a very good friend of mine, a dear friend, committed suicide some years ago. She was young, maybe 30. She was exquisitely sensitive and finding a reliably safe place for her to live was almost impossible. Her biggest problem though, no money except the minimum social security income. Thoughts of her suicide still make my mind go numb. I myself will commit suicide sometime in the next few years. Why? Too maladaptive with no money as offset. 
About five years after this man wrote this passage, I met him when I was traveling on the West Coast. He is a very intelligent, reasonable, and likable person who is doing his best to stay alive, and I hope he does. One sometimes hears reporters or people in the medical profession say somewhat glibly that no one ever dies of multiple chemical sensitivity. Would these same people say that no one ever dies from bipolar disease, which has a significant mortality rate from suicide? Twelve years as an advocate for the chemically sensitive has led me to the sad realization that a large number of chemically sensitive people have taken their own lives and many others are inching ever closer to that decision because they find it such a daunting task to locate a safe place to live or work and are rapidly running out of money. And at the same time that they are engaged in this Herculean struggle, far too many of them are facing a discouraging skepticism from those about them. What can people who are lucky enough not to have developed MCS do to ameliorate this tragic situation? Keeping an open mind and a compassionate attitude would be a good first step. An overview of the subject of MCS is available on the website of the Chemical Sensitivity Foundation, www.chemicalsensitivityfoundation.org. That website also contains a long bibliography of research articles on chemical sensitivity that have been published in peer-reviewed journals. Even just skimming that bibliography should dispel the notion that there's no scientific evidence that MCS is a physiologically based medical condition. This 12-page research bibliography, which includes studies from not only the United States, but also Japan, Denmark, Germany, Greece, Spain, Italy, and Sweden, also appears on pages 289 to 300 of this book. Physicians and nurses need to educate themselves more about the condition of chemical sensitivity so that MCS patients can get more help from the mainstream medical community. At present, disbelief among many physicians has the outcome that many chemically sensitive people seek out alternative medicine practitioners. The latter are helpful in many cases, but there are also many people in this group who are taking advantage of the desperate plight of people with multiple chemical sensitivity. It is particularly important that psychiatrists, psychologists, and social workers begin to understand that MCS is indeed a medically valid diagnosis and not just a quaint and annoying delusion of patients who are paranoid about chemicals in the modern world. When professionals in these fields view MCS patients as being delusional and paranoid because they report the chemical exposures are causing them to develop various symptoms, the consequences can be extreme. There have been cases in which family members or neighbors of MCS patients have attempted, sometimes successfully, to have them admitted to mental hospitals for no reason but their belief that they are suffering from multiple chemical sensitivity. Some professionals in this field, as well as members of the general public, have gone so far as to suggest that parents who have children with MCS are creating this illness in their children in order to obtain attention from the medical community. These skeptics are suggesting that what is involved in these chemical sensitivity cases is a rare syndrome that is termed Munchausen by proxy, in which a parent actually inflicts minor injuries on a child because they enjoy the resultant medical attention. The mother of an eight-year-old boy named Zach, who developed severe chemical sensitivity following a furnace explosion when he was a baby, faced this kind of accusation. She wrote, people tend to be skeptical about Zach's illness and look for other explanations for whatever is wrong with him. After an article about Zach appeared in the local newspaper, some woman went to school and handed one of the administrators an article on Munchausen by proxy. Christy Howarth is a single mother with a 12-year-old son who almost lost her son in a court battle with California's Child Protective Services. She had been a teacher in the California system for over 25 years with a specialty in teaching gifted children. Unfortunately, Christy and her son both developed MCS in their adjacent school buildings located a block from the ocean. She re reports that there were mold problems in both schools her building had ongoing gas leaks, 
and contaminated soil was removed from the sites of schools. Blood tests showed benzene in her blood and xylene in her son's blood. Christy went to some highly respected physicians in the field of chemical injury and mold exposures and has extensive documentation for her and her son's health conditions. Their chemical sensitivity is severe enough that she could no longer teach and he cannot attend school. He would develop migraine headaches, breathing difficulty, extreme fatigue, and nosebleeds in his school building. He has been diagnosed with asthma, and his symptoms now include facial tics and rashes upon exposure to various chemicals. Christy finally decided to homeschool him, and his symptoms have diminished with reduced exposure. An ophthalmologist who saw Christy was concerned because she had inflamed eyelids and recommended that she consult an infectious disease specialist. Christy decided to include her son in the appointment because his eyelids were similarly inflamed. To her dismay, the specialist whom she consulted was totally dismissive of the records Christy brought along that documented chemical sensitivity and mold reactions in her and her son. In fact, she immediately reported Christy to Child Protective Services saying that she was delusional about her son's health problems. That started a nightmare for Christy, who was forced to spend almost all her savings to fight a difficult legal battle. And Christy was alone in this fight. She was raised by her grandparents, now deceased, and her son's father is not in the picture. Christy not only had no one to help her financially, she was also devastated to think that her son, who is the only family she has, could be taken away from her and put into foster care. Her son was also traumatized by the whole affair. What could be more terrifying to a 12-year-old boy than to think he is about to be taken away from his mother, who is the only family he has? Life with a foster family who would have almost certainly been instructed by Child Protective Services to ignore his delusion about chemical sensitivity would have been an impossible nightmare for this child. Fortunately, Christy finally prevailed in the court system, and the court procedures to allow Child Protective Services to assume custody of her child were terminated, but not without a crushing financial cost to Christy. In an appalling aftermare, fortunately, Christy finally prevailed in the court system, and the court procedures that Fortunately, Christy finally prevailed in the court system and the court procedures to allow Child Protective Services to assume custody of her child were terminated, but not without a crushing financial cost to Christy. In an appalling aftermath of the whole nightmare, Christy's name was listed on an index of child abusers after the initial visit she received from a social worker from Child Protective Services who thought Christy's medical beliefs were delusional. This means that if she recovers her health sufficiently to be able to teach school again, no school system will ever hire her. Her legal counsel has advised her that it is a very difficult and costly procedure to have one's name removed from the index of child abusers once it has been placed there. A little time spent by individuals who are not chemically sensitive to educate themselves about the field will have an important effect on the lives of many desperate people like Christy. And such increased awareness of chemical sensitivity may even produce unexpected health benefits for those who have never pondered the issue. I recently learned that as a result of her fear that her son could be taken away from her, Christy has left the country and is now living in Europe. Chapter 5 of Amputated Lives is titled The Exxon Valdez Cleanup. Here is a passage from that chapter. One man hired to help in the cleanup was a construction worker named Robert Bunker, who describes his story in part two. Excuse me. One man hired, excuse me. Here is a passage from that chapter. One man hired to help in the cleanup was a construction worker named Robert Bunker, who describes in his story in part two the difficult working conditions on the beach. All day long, we were wallowing in oil. We were falling down all the time. I screwed up my knees real bad, slipping on all those oily rocks, 
and I still have lots of pain in my knees. It was very bad. The rocks were kind of like bowling balls covered with oil. It was a big slippery mess. After the first few days, I was having nightmares that I was drowning in the oil. The company hired by Exxon to clean up the beaches was named Vico. Vico's plan for cleaning the beaches evolved during the first few days. Initially, workers were given pom-poms, so named because the bunches of strands of absorbent material resemble a cheerleader's pom-poms. During these early days, the plan was to have workers wipe the oil off the rocks with these absorbent pom-poms, which would then be put into plastic bags for transport elsewhere. Of course, it didn't take too many days for the futility of such an effort to become apparent, although this method continued to be used in a limited way. Greta, a beach worker who developed chemical sensitivity after working on the oil spill, describes what it was like to clean the oil off the rocks with pom-poms, she wrote. We would sit down on the rocks while we were working because it was hard to bend down for hour after hour. There were fumes coming off the oily rocks, and between the rocks, there were puddles of oil containing decaying seaweed that smelled really bad. I remember a couple of spots that smelled so terrible that we could only work there for a few minutes at a time. People were getting lightheaded and dizzy and nauseous from the oil fumes. We sometimes felt like we might pass out. They had to take one person off the beach because she was starting to hallucinate. We were always sitting in oil, and the odor would give us headaches. When we leaned down to work, oil would often spatter us. We were always sitting in oil, and the odor would give us headaches. When we leaned down to work, oil would often splatter on our faces, and sometimes our wrists would get exposed. We couldn't pull off our gloves to eat without ending up with oil on our hands and on our food. After you pulled off one glove, you had to pull the other glove off with your bare hand, so of course you ended up with oil all over that hand. Vico's next plan was to wash the oil off the rocks and beaches onto the edge of the bay, catch it with booms, and then skim it up into boats to be shipped elsewhere. Streams of water from high pressure hoses were used to dislodge the oil from the rocky beaches. Crews soon discovered that hot water would pull more of the oil off the rocks, so hot water was used whenever possible. Steam guns were also used to steam the oil off the rocks. The steam and hot water were a problem not only for the plants and marine animals on the beaches, but also for the cleanup workers. Unfortunately, both the steam from the steam guns and the hot water from the high pressure hoses created an oily mist that the workers were inhaling and getting on their faces and in their eyes. Regrettably, government agents that should have protected the workers from this exposure did not do their job. <coughs> In a statement that is eerily reminiscent of Christine Todd Whitman's declaration to New Yorkers a few days after 9-11 that their air was safe to breathe, the Alaska Department of Health and Social Services issued an advisory stating, there is no risk of adverse health effects from breathing the air. Risks are greatest to workers heavily exposed to oil during some cleanup activities, but the risk to these workers is considered to be low and with appropriate training and personal protective equipment as required by the hazardous waste regulations, cleanup activities can continue and workers can be confident that their health will not be compromised. On the beaches in Alaska, as in the rubble and smoke near Ground Zero, personal protective equipment was in short supply and even though the Occ Occupational Safety and Health Act, OSHA, should have protected the workers in Prince William Sound and Lower Manhattan, that was not the case. Some workers survived their exposures in Prince William Sound with no apparent health effects. Others were not so lucky, as is indicated by the stories of three brothers who cleaned the Alaskan beaches and three scientists who traveled from California to study the cleanup process so that their state could be better prepared for its next oil spill. The Potter brothers, Roger, Mike, and Paul were construction workers who'd been having trouble finding work after the Alaskan pipeline was finished, so they quickly signed on to help in the cleanup operation. Roger was the lucky one of the three brothers. During the first couple of months he was working on the oil spill, he did develop some brown blisters on his lower legs that would pop and ooze a brown liquid, but they were gone by November. <coughs> 
At this point, he doesn't think that his work on the spill affected his health in any lasting way. His brother Mike was not so lucky, as he recounts in the story of the Potter brothers that appears in part two. Mike wrote, <clears throat> We felt nauseated all the time we were working out there on the beaches, and headaches were rampant. Then in addition to the oil we were exposed to, there were a bunch of chemicals that we used. We would request and request that we be given the hazardous chemical plat that was supposed to be on top of the containers of chemicals, but we never could find out what ingredients were in the containers. We didn't have more than a name on the container. We nicknamed one chemical Agent Orange. One of the things it was used for was to wash the oil off the boats and the skiffs. It was eating the membranes in people's noses. On our second and third R&R, word was getting out that if you were asked to work around this chemical, you should refuse to do it. I started having some fairly serious memory loss problems a few years after the spill, even though I was only in my 30s. People would say, Mike, how are you doing? And I wouldn't recognize them. I used to know the phone numbers of people I call a lot. Now I have to look them up. I developed some growths that looked like a huge wart. They were three quarters inch thick and about the size of a silver dollar. Those big wart-like growths appeared about three years after I'd worked on the oil spill cleanup. A lot of my ailments started around 1993. That was when I started having some blackout spells and getting serious fatigue. Eventually, Mike's health problems made it necessary for him to give up construction work and become a mechanic. Even in that job, he found that his arthritis was made worse by some of the cleaning solvents he had to use. Chemical sensitivity was an even greater problem for the youngest brother, Paul, as Mike recounts. We were picking up debris like dead, oil-soaked wildlife that gave off a terrible rotten stench. We put this stuff in plastic bags to be picked up by a little barge, and these bags were sitting on the beaches in the hot sun. Usually the tops were twisted, but when Paul picked up this one bag, the top swirled open and gases poured out into his face. He staggered around and said he couldn't see, so some guys had to grab him. They sent him to Anchorage on a helicopter, and he spent several days in hospital there. The exposure kind of paralyzed his breathing. He got some of the stuff in one of his eyes and almost lost it. He was actually blind for a while. After that incident, almost any chemical would cause Paul to feel nauseated. According to Paul's widow, after he stopped working on the oil spill cleanup, products that he had regularly used in his carpentry work started bothering him. She wrote, there were at least four times that he had to get medical attention because of exposure to something toxic. One time when he was putting a sealant on a deck, he got really sick and dizzy, so they had to take him to a clinic. They called a poison hotline and hooked him up to IVs to get him stabilized. Sometimes he would have a milder reaction, but he would still end up stuck in bed for a couple of days with a violent headache, feeling yucky and kind of weak. He would react to almost anything that was petroleum-based. Once when we were painting an apartment and using an oil-based primer on the walls, he almost passed out into the tray of paint. He had never reacted to things like that before Exxon Valdez. At the time Paul died, the two of us were working as caretakers for an apartment complex. The week before he died, he told me that the gas fumes from the snowblower were beginning to make him sick. After he told me that the gas fumes from the snowblower were beginning to bother him, I tried to get him to let me do all the snow blowing around the apartments. It was the man thing, though. He wouldn't let me do it. It was only a half hour after he came in from snow blowing one day that he had a massive heart attack. He died in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. His doctor said that the snow blower gas fumes were most likely what had killed him. Paul was only 44 when he died. Among the results of the intense public focus on how quickly the oil was being dispersed was Exxon's dubious decision to use chemical dispersants on the oil-covered beaches, a decision that led to some serious toxic exposures for the three scientists from California. Bob Curry was part of this scientific team that traveled to Prince William Sound from the Monterey, California area, where he taught geology at the University of California at Santa Cruz. One member of the team was a former physician, one was a marine biologist, and Bob was a geologist in the field of water quality. Bob had at one point in his life taught at the University of Alaska 
and was particularly interested in the marine food chain, including whales. The three scientists were especially interested in learning how California might minimize the damage to marine life if there were another oil spill like the one that had occurred near Santa Barbara. They traveled around Prince William Sound in their own small boat, filming the cleanup crews on beaches and trying to evaluate the effectiveness of the various cleanup methods. They went ashore on a number of islands and peninsulas and usually camped on the beaches. One of Bob's projects was to dig pits on the beaches and to analyze how much the oil lay below the surface of the beach, ready to be released in a storm. In some places, they learned that the beach crews were using Corexit, a chemical about which Bob and his teammates knew nothing at first. Then they met with Alaska state officials who said it was important to be very careful around this chemical. The officials showed them labels saying that one should have no skin contact and should not breathe the fumes. But the latter injunction seemed hard to carry out because the chemical was being sprayed on the beaches. The workers who were applying the core exit were wearing chemical suits, but the cleanup workers who followed them in a day or two, like Bob and his colleagues, had no protective gear. In all, the three scientists spent seven days working on the beaches. At the time, they experienced no effects, but 10 days after they had returned to California, Bob developed a severe respiratory problem that resembled pneumonia. When it persisted, he began to wonder if his fairly extensive handling of Corex contaminated sand could have caused his illness. He found out that the marine biologist who had gone to Prince William Sound with him had also become sick shortly after returning, but had recovered in a week, whereas Bob Curry had been sick at that point for over a month with a pneumonia-like illness. The physician, who was one of the three scientists on this expedition, actually died of cancer within a month or two of their return. Um, it seems unlikely that his cancer was in a bad stage or he would never have been out on that expedition, which was very challenging from a physical point of view. So while there's no proof that the core exit and the chemicals to which he was exposed led to his uh, very sudden death from this cancer, um, it is suggestive that something accelerated that whole process and led to his death. Now returning to my book, uh, to read more about Bob Curry, who is the uh, geologist who developed the respiratory problem. Finally, after six months, Bob Curry was able to shake off the problem in his lungs which physicians had never been able to diagnose. Although Bob Curry was able to get rid of his pneumonia-like lung problem, he developed acute asthma not long after he returned from Alaska and now gets an asthma attack from exposure to all sorts of chemicals. Unfortunately, Bob has in the last several years developed a very serious health problem, as he noted in an email he recently sent me. I have now been diagnosed with rather pronounced brain atrophy that the neurologist suggests must be chemically caused. I am now being probed, spinal tapped, and chemically assessed to try and find out what could have caused it. Because I am now 71 and the Prince William Sound core exit exposure was long ago, I have little confidence that anything will be found. But the neurologists say that the changes are dramatic and progressive and must be chemically induced. Symptoms at first were a staggering gait and movement disorders in indicating cerebellar ataxia resulting from the MRI verified cerebellar atrophy. Now the primary concern is loss of more of the primary brain. Based on movement disorders that became serious in about 2002 and lack of ability to maintain balance, I first had a series of CAT scans and then recently have had a series of MRIs. These various scans show progressive atrophy of the whole brain that is not caused by local strokes or accidents or any direct causes except possible past chemical exposure. Present symptoms are like some aspects of Parkinson's disease, but these symptoms are not the result of losses of only that part of the basal brain stem, stem and or cerebellum involved in Parkinson's disease. The chemicals that were used in connection with the spill cleanup were also a big factor in the problems that Dolly LaJoy developed after working on the spill. 
Her health deteriorated sharply after she finished working on the oil spill cleanup. But years later, she not only had to put up with failing health that made it impossible for her to keep working, but was also told by one physician that she was a hypochondriac with no real health problems. It was clear to me in the phone interviews I did with Dolly that she was a very sick woman. She was coughing so badly from her asthma during our first conversation that I had to suggest that I call her back in a few days. Dolly's story in part two details her widespread exposure to toxins during her work on the beaches and in the decontamination unit where she worked for 12 hours every night for several weeks to remove the oil from the beach workers' clothing, boots, and gloves. She writes, we washed the oily coveralls and underwear in the washing machine. We used Tide at first, but then they started sending us some strong solvents to add because it was really hard to get the oil out of everything. It was industrial strength stuff. I don't remember all the names, but one product we used was Simple Green. The laundry room, which held just one washer and dryer, was small, and the vapor made me sick a lot of the time. When you washed the oily clothes and dried them in the dryer, you had oil vapor everywhere, and it was a strong smell. Sometimes I felt like I was drunk and felt like I was going to pass out. I would have to go outside to get away from the fumes and get some fresh air. Whenever it was really cold, as it often was at night, we would have to keep the laundry room door shut to keep from freezing, and then the fumes were really thick. Simple Green, the product to which Dolly was exposed in the laundry room, along with crude oil, was one of the many industrial strength solvents that cleanup workers used. Warnings from the EPA about janitorial products say that if at all possible, avoid janitorial products with the following ingredients, and they list something called 2-butotoxyethanol, which is one of the ingredients in Simple Green. Dolly, like the other Exxon Valdez cleanup workers, whose stories are included in part two, has been left with a troubling legacy of chemical sensitivity, as she notes. Quote, traffic exhaust gives me a headache and makes me nauseated. Cigarette smoke and certain cleaning products and perfumes make me choke and cough, give me a headache, and make me sick to my stomach. Greta, too, is now chemically sensitive. I always end up with a headache if I use hairspray, and I can't use perfume now because it gives me a headache and often makes me feel angry. I have to avoid gasoline and diesel. My parents and my sister who worked the spill with me can't use perfume now either, and we all have to be very careful what cleaning products we used. Chemical exposures are also now a serious problem for Robert Bunker, who said, I get bad headaches and real shaky when I'm around gasoline or paint fumes or smoke. Shortly after the end of the four-day ground war in 1991 in the Persian Gulf, our troops blew up a vast munitions dump at Kamasiya that contained sarin nerve gas. One of the soldiers who helped blow up Kamasiya was Sergeant Brian Martin, who later described in testimony to the Shays Committee in Congress the health problems he had developed after Kamasiya, which included chemical sensitivity. He testified, since Kamasiya, I suffer from blood and vomit and stools, blurred vision, shaking and trembling, muscles weakening, chest pounding like my heart was going to explode. I suffer from excruciatingly painful headaches, memory loss, and severe diarrhea, mood swings. I violently vomit if I smell perfumes, vapors, or chemicals. I get lost and forget where I am sometimes. I am an ex-paratrooper who needs a cane and a wheelchair to get around. My joints swell, burn, and hurt. Many other soldiers who developed Gulf War syndrome after serving in the 1991 Gulf War have also reported developing multiple chemical sensitivity. One such soldier was Bob Jones. He wrote this, I had spent eight years in the 82nd Airborne Division as a paratrooper so I had had extensive exposure to jet fuel and jet fumes, and these things had never bothered me. But having spent 45 days in the area where the oil wells were burning, breathing the noxious fumes on a daily basis, now just the smell of diesel fuel makes me severely nauseated, dizzy, and very sick. I try to avoid getting behind school buses because diesel exhaust
lost really bothers me, as do other odors and smells. Perfumes are also a problem. I don't wear any type of cologne because it makes me nauseous. <clears throat> Sergeant Sherry McGahee reported gasoline. That makes me sick of my stomach. <clears throat> Colonel Herb Smith, who is the highest ranking army officer to develop Gulf War syndrome, reported, I couldn't pump my own gas. The gas fumes would make me vomit. If I breathed automobile fumes, truck fumes, again, I'm nauseous, trying not to vomit. The following passages come from chapter seven of my book, The World Trade Center Disaster. Like so many other health professionals across the city and indeed the country, Dr. Stephen Levin, medical director of the Mount Sinai Occupational and Environmental Clinic, was appalled in the early days after the attack that people were not being warned how dangerous the Ground Zero site was. He stated, well, we were horrified on September 18, 2001, when the head of the EPA, Christine Todd Whitman, got on television and said she was glad to be able to reassure people that the air quality was safe. I remember listening to that and being aghast, just horrified that she could say such a thing. I knew that she didn't have the data to be able to make such a statement, that at that point, there was very limited monitoring that had been done. Initially, there was a strong suspicion that many of us had that this was a decision, this pronouncement about the safety of air quality down there, that was based less on public health and less on monitoring data than a desire to get lower Manhattan running economically, get Wall Street going, get the stock exchange going. There was a lot of talk about that. It wasn't until later that we had confirmation that, lo and behold, this really was a strong influence on the EPA's pronouncements because it turned out that the Council on Environmental Quality, the president's own sub-cabinet level group in the White House, had influenced what the EPA was going to say. In fact, the EPA had been preparing to issue a cautionary message saying, we're not sure what's going on down there, but you ought to be careful because this, in fact, may be a toxic environment. What the Council on Environmental Quality said to the EPA was, emphasize reassurance, de-emphasize hazard, and so the EPA reversed itself. Dr. Levin's fears were well-founded as it was established by the research that he later performed as co-director of the World Trade Center Medical Monitoring Program. During the time that he was doing that work, he realized that many of the patients were becoming very sensitive to fragrances. Dr. Stephen Levin spoke in my 9-11 documentary about the unusual reactions that WTC patients were reporting to him. He stated, another striking thing is that many of our patients are much more reactive to strong odors than they were before. I have patients who cannot walk into a department store cosmetic area without experiencing shortness of breath and chest tightness in ways they never did before. I have patients who cannot get on an elevator where someone is wearing strong perfume or cologne without experiencing fairly intense respiratory reactions. We don't always understand why this is so, but it is extremely commonly reported among our World Trade Center responders, and many of our patients say that they are simply unable to wear fragrances themselves or be around others, family members, friends who wear such fragrances because they simply can't tolerate them. John Ciferrazzo is an iron worker who rushed to ground zero as soon as he saw the towers burning. He worked long hours for the first few days, helping to cut up the massive iron beams. Even after he had to return to his regular construction job, he went to ground zero after he left his regular job each day in order to spend several hours helping to cut through the debris. He spent 29 days working on the pile, not without lasting damage to his health. He writes, after breathing in all that toxic dust, I started getting repeated lung infections and pneumonia. Now I have reactive airway disease, what they call COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. I don't know if I can ever hold any kind of real job now. I was in such good shape prior to 9-11. I could climb columns. That was part of my life when I was building skyscrapers. You have to have a high upper body ratio to your mass rate to be able to pull yourself up a column and do that continually up repeated floors. And I had no problem doing that whatsoever. 
Today, I don't even think about going up the stairs that are set on the job site to get to the upper elevations. Like so many others who were exposed to the ground zero toxins, John is now sensitive to a wide array of common chemical substances. Since 9-11, the smell of gasoline and diesel fuel bothers me so much that I don't get out and even fuel my own vehicles. I don't even want that stuff on my hands because of the odor. Being around the job sites and being around the smell of the diesel and gasoline, I was constantly getting problems with my throat. I would wind up going hoarse and I would lose my voice. Now I get headaches and burning in my lungs when I smell cigarette smoke, even though I used to work all the time in an atmosphere in which you would smell welders burning welding wire or burners cutting through iron. Since 9-11, the smell of smoke sometimes makes me gag or feel like throwing up. I can't use many types of cologne or aftershave. I can't take that smell. It causes a burning feeling inside my nostrils. I notice now that some types of cologne have a very, very strong pungent odor to them. Whenever I smell that kind of smell, I just have to get away from it. Kelly Colangelo lived in an apartment close to green, Ground Zero but was working in New Jersey when the terrorist attack on the Twin Towers occurred. She managed to return to her apartment briefly on September 12th. Kelly eventually developed sensitivity to many chemicals in her environment. She wrote, a few years after 9-11, I noticed that I was becoming very sensitive to certain smells like perfumes, colognes, cigarette smoke, and diesel fuel. When I walk down the sidewalk and somebody is smoking, I could just scream. I just can't stand the smell anymore. When someone is wearing too much cologne, I have to get away from them. I hold my breath now when I walk by buses because the diesel smell is too much for me to handle and gives me a headache. Rachel Hughes was a young woman who volunteered to help unload trucks and pass out sandwiches to workers at Ground Zero. She would pay dearly for that act of compassion and patriotism as she describes in her story that appears in part two and in my documentary, The Toxic Clouds of 9-11. She writes, within days of the 9-11 attacks, I had a fever and a constant headache. I was also vomiting and feeling dizzy. A bad cough made it hard for me to sleep. I was also having trouble breathing and had considerable chest pain and tightness. One of my worst problems was that large unsightly sores started erupting on my scalp, face, neck, arms, and back. My health problems related to the 9-11 toxic exposures have steadily worsened. I frequently have pneumonia or bronchitis. Daily headaches are a problem, and I continue to have constant chest pain and pressure. My diagnoses include lung scarring. Chemical sensitivity became a significant problem for me after my exposure to 9-11 toxins. Since that point, I have become sensitive to all types of chemical fumes that never gave me any problems before. I have had to stop wearing perfume and start using unscented body lotion and shampoo. The chemicals like ammonia and solvents that they use to clean the elevator or halls in my building make it difficult for me to breathe and sometimes give me a migraine. I actually try to hold my breath in the elevator because the cleaning products affect me so strongly. I've always been a dedicated artist, but I can't paint right now because I'm too sensitive to the paint, even water-based paint. Bonnie Giebfried was an emergency medical technician who was among the first ambulance crews responding to the terrorist attack. She was heavily exposed to the toxic dust when she barely escaped the huge mass of debris and dust that rolled through the area when each tower collapsed. Her health deteriorated so sharply that she had to give up her EMT job. Bonnie wrote, I had never had asthma before 9-11, but by the end of the day, I had had three bad asthma attacks. That feeling of not being able to catch your breath, not being able to fill your lungs, is such a horrible, horrible feeling. It feels like someone's crushing your chest, sucking everything out of you. Before 9-11, I was in great health. I was playing on three soccer teams, three softball teams, a racquetball league, a paddleball league. I was fishing, hiking, climbing mountains. I can't even climb upstairs now. I just can't catch my breath. I have chronic sinusitis, bronchitis, asthma. I just got over having pneumonia for the third time. Never had pneumonia before 9-11. Since 9-11, I've become very sensitive to various chemicals that never used to bother me, 
so I have to be really careful what I expose myself to. The other night I went out for Japanese food, which is one of my favorite things to do. I was having a good time with my life partner when this guy came in who was wearing a lot of cologne. My throat started closing up and I began to get chest pains. I had to leave the restaurant, which was really disappointing. On other occasions, perfume exposure in a restaurant has caused me to become nauseated. The multiple chemical sensitivity issues that have come from 9-11 have not been addressed. I can't do normal, everyday things because of my chemical sensitivity. I really have to police myself to make sure that I'm not going to be exposed to gas fumes or the propane for the barbecue. Household cleaners, oh my God, you just might as well pack me up at that point and send me to the hospital. I'd like to note that during the recent 10th anniversary commemoration for 9-11, Bonnie Giebfried appeared with both Sanjay Gupta and with Soledad O'Brien on CNN programs. During those programs, she didn't mention that among all her other health problems, she now suffers from multiple chemical sensitivity. Chapter 8 of my book is titled Katrina's Toxic Aftermath. It begins in this way. Hurricane Katrina's torrential wind and rain left a swath of widespread destruction in an area covered by petroleum refineries, chemical processing plants, and pesticide factories. The September 26, 2005 issue of Business Week referred to the challenge of dealing with the tons and tons of, quote, lethal goop, end quote, left behind by Katrina as the, quote, mother of all toxic cleanups, end quote. As the result of the hurricane's destruction, many toxic chemicals were released into the ground, air, and water, and the long-term consequences are an urgent issue that few government agencies are addressing. The inevitable result of the toxic exposures faced by volunteers and residents in the Gulf states is that a sizable percentage of those exposed will have developed multiple chemical sensitivity. Anyone who was aware of MCS shuddered when they heard that people who had lost their homes in the hurricane were going to be housed in trailers provided by FEMA because people who have developed chemical sensitivity almost always find it hard to tolerate living in trailers which have substantial levels of formaldehyde because of the insulation, paneling, subflooring, and particle board cabinets and furniture all contained in a small confined space. In the aftermath of Katrina, FEMA hurriedly ordered as many trailers as it could from around the country, and a lot of these used some rather toxic, particularly toxic, particle board from China that contained way higher levels of formaldehyde than was usually the case. So there's no wonder that we heard so many reports of people getting sick in those trailers. What makes the FEMA trailer situation especially tragic is that it is not unlikely that large numbers of the trailer residents who have become sick will now react to other chemicals that they encounter in their everyday life, such as paint, perfume, auto exhaust, cigarette smoke, diesel fumes, and air fresheners. For those who have developed multiple chemical sensitivity, they will unfortunately find that this condition will have a significant impact upon their lives. It is particularly sad to think of the little children who have been sensitized to the chemicals they will encounter throughout the rest of their lives. Lynn Henderson describes the effect living in a FEMA trailer has had on two little girls she was raising because their mother was killed in an auto accident. She wrote, the three-year-old and the 17-month-old baby are now very sensitive to all sorts of scented products. I started noticing that when I would put on body lotion after my shower and then walk by the baby, she would sneeze over and over again until she was out of breath. Then in a minute, she would start sneezing again. I can't wear perfume anymore because it bothers the little girls so much, and they also react to hairspray and cleaning products I use. The chemical sensitivity induced in these little girls will almost certainly cause very troublesome problems as they enter the school system and eventually the workforce. This is a heavy responsibility for the federal government, which failed in, the, in an abysmal way these children and other trailer residents. Sometimes people ask me how I became an MCS advocate. 
Well, about 37 years ago, I developed MCS myself. And it's always hard to say, you know, how one develops MCS because one's life contains so many exposures. In my case, when I was a child, at one period, I wanted to have my own room, so I moved down to the basement, slept right next to a coal furnace, and the clinkers would be cooling every night about six, eight feet from my bed. I can still remember that strong smell. And then when I was a young wife, I would buy antique furniture and refinish a lot of furniture because that was a good way to furnish a house, get nice things without paying a lot of money. And stripping furniture is really quite a toxic process. And even though the labels on the can said use with proper ventilation, I opened the window a couple inches and thought that I'd taken care of it, which of course is not the case. And we also spent a half a year in Paris and we had a gas hot water heater in the kitchen that was quite smelly. I can remember going in every morning and there was such an odor of gas in the kitchen that I would fling open the windows. And it was really about a few months after that that I first noticed uh, that I had MCS. I actually had developed migraine headaches uh, at the age of 35 for the first time in my life. I only had them two years. Never again have I had a migraine because I avoid the things that would trigger them. And which in my case was an exposure to cigarette smoke or diesel fumes or caffeine. Um, then within a year I began to get arthritic pains in the fall, but I realized quite quickly that that was when our oil burner furnace went on. We converted to electric heat and never again had any arthritic pains, and I've done all sorts of hiking in the Rocky Mountains, and so I'm glad I realized what was causing the joint pains. So I've lived a life that's been very active. So I do think in general that if people understand the effects that chemicals can be having on their health, they can be much healthier, live a much happier, normal, healthy life.